Well, good to be with you all this evening. I'm, uh, I'm thankful for this opportunity we have. Good to have you here, Seth, as well, with us. I think most of us have probably read over the years various stories about families that have pet snakes that escape and hurt people, right? You've probably read those stories before. This is an example of such a story. In July 2011, a Florida couple that had a pet python found out in a very tragic way that pythons can be very harmful. The python escaped from its cage and they found the snake wrapped around its two-year-old, the family's two-year-old daughter uh, while the python was biting the child's face. Uh, unfortunately, the girl was already dead by the time they found the snake. Law enforcement, the police got involved, of course, and they had decided that it was more than just an accident because the, sn the snake had escaped from its cage several times before. And they, when they examined the cage, they found that it was covered with just a duvet cover and some bungee cords and safety pins, which is not enough, obviously, to keep a python inside. So this couple was charged with third degree murder, as well as manslaughter of a child, and they were sentenced to 12 years in prison. What if I told you that you had committed a similar crime? Not with, of course, a literal snake, I doubt any of us have pet snakes, but by forgetting that we are in a spiritual war and that you have been neglectful of an ancient serpent who has been harming you, your family, and others around you. So often I look around, so often I look around and I see all kinds of problems. I see problems with sin, personal sin. I see problems in families. I see problems in the church. I see a lack of progress. I see problems all around. And of course you say, why? Why is it like this? And of course the answer is that the church is under a very powerful attack. And we have an enemy that we have grossly underestimated. Most people hardly think enough about this enemy. And I can even ask you, how many of you woke up this morning and felt a sense of danger or urgency in your mind and in your heart that you are in a sense of battle? We have a very real enemy who is on the move seeking whom he can devour. He will do absolutely whatever it takes to stop someone's progress. He will do whatever it takes to harm someone spiritually. He is crafty, he is merciless, and he is determined. One of the, the hallmarks of any formidable enemy is they capitalize on your weaknesses. They find your weaknesses and they figure out how to exploit those weaknesses. So if we take it down to the realm of just something uh, more ordinary, the realm of, of sports, good coaches and players, they watch the films of their opponents, right? They watch the films for hours and hours so that they can find where their opponents are weak and exploit those weaknesses. If somebody has a weak backhand, if they can't hit a backhand, say high up with topspin, guess where that ball is going to go? If someone can't drive to the left side of the basketball hoop, guess wh which way that they're going to force that player? If someone doesn't do well with a knuckleball, guess what pitches they're getting? <clears throat> when, when I was in high school, I played high school and college, I played on the tennis team, uh, and then in, in college I played NCAA. My high school team was not very good. and we, there was one player, I won't say his name, who, he was actually technically a good player, but when it got to crunch time, when it got to those key points that 
you know, it's 40-40 or something like that. What we all learned about him, we'll call him Bob. It's not his real name. We'll call, we'll call him Bob. What we all learned about Bob was that you could yell out at Bob, hey, Bob, don't double fault, right? Uh, that's what you do when you, when you mess up on a serve, and he would double fault. Uh, we would consistently tell Bob, hey, Bob, don't hit it into the net. Bob would hit it into the net. And it was this kind of sad combination of being a little bit cruel to Bob and having fun with Bob. But he would consistently lose his games because we found his weakness. And everybody knew exactly what to say to Bob. No matter how good his technical skills were, he would crumple in this moment. As a family, we recently finished watching a couple of documentaries nature documentaries, and of course, pretty much all good nature documentaries have chase scenes, right? Where there's some predator that's going after some herd of whatever it is, zebras or antelopes. And guess which animal always gets picked out of the herd? Which one always gets picked out? It's the slow one, it's the baby, it's the one that's just not quite able to keep up with everybody else, right? There was a, a scene in one of them, which if you come to my house, ask me to show it to you because it is incredible. That it, it wasn't just one predator, it was dozens and dozens of predators that were chasing one victim, one creature. It was a group of snakes chasing a baby iguana. Again, if you come to my house and ask me to show it to you, it is amazing. And there's dozens of snakes chasing this iguana, and it is fighting through the snakes, it's climbing rocks, it's jumping away from all these snakes that are snapping its jaws at the iguana. And when you see this little clip, it's like four minutes or so, and again, ask me when you come over, it, it will strike you as, as um, almost demonic when you see all of these, these creatures here. It's a lot more accurate probably to what our lives are because we don't just have one enemy. There's Satan, the demons, there's all of the forces in the world. If, if such an iguana were to trip or stumble or injure itself, would those snakes say, oh, you know what? Hey, sorry, we understand it. You had, you had a little bit of a disadvantage here. We play fair. Keep going, iguana. We're going to let you slide here. Of course not. No, no true predator would ever do that. It delights in weaknesses. It loves weaknesses, and it seeks to exploit them. Satan is, of course been described in the Bible as like a lion or a serpent. Never seen a lion say, ah, oh, sorry, gazelle, sorry, water buffalo, that you, you hurt yourself. I'm going to let you go this time. I'm just, I'm really feeling bad for you. And I understand that life is hard out here in the savannah. No way. No such predator shows mercy. And in fact, What's even probably more frightening about this picture is that the predator knows your weaknesses better than you know your weaknesses. We think we have some kind of sense of, of who we are. We're all pretty bad at that. Your weaknesses are his delight. We recently got a couple of <clears throat> wedding invitations in the mail. <clears throat> and wow, they're just beautiful invitations. You, you look at these invitations and you know they have the kind of lacy border some of them have that wax paper in the middle. Is that what they call it, wax paper? I don't know why they put that in, but it looks, it looks <laughs> nice. All the beautiful fonts there. You can tell a lot of time goes into these, these wedding invitations. And it's very pleasing. It's very aesthetically pleasing to our eyes. There have been some of these where, like, oh, I, I don't want to throw this away because it's so beautiful, right? You don't want to put it in the recycling. You're just like, oh, it's just so much time went into this, so much love. And, uh, you want to tuck it away in a, in a file or some kind of souvenir book you have to remember it. Because we like to look at these. We like to behold these, these beautiful wedding invitations. Satan loves to gaze at your weaknesses. They are his beauty. They are what he is just like, wow, look at her weakness in this area. Look at his weakness in this area. It is beautiful. Are you weak in prayer? Are you weak in scripture? Are you weak in temptation? Are you weak in worship? Are you a hearer and not a doer? 
Are you prone to anger, materialism, lust, laziness, addiction, selfishness, mocking? Satan is gazing at these features that you have, and they are an invitation for him. You had better believe that Satan is gazing that, at these weaknesses and is going to exploit them again and again and again and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and many of you here would all, if I, I won't ask you to raise your hands and say, do you know the experience of what it's like to have been chronically defeated in one area of your life for years and years and years? You know the feeling of being in the grip of something evil, something stronger. Let's think for a moment about Peter, the Apostle Peter. Peter thought he was a a tough guy. He thought he was a loyal person. He thought he was someone who Jesus uh, would, would have, uh, he would always have Jesus uh, as his, his main loyalty there. He thought he would stay with him through thick and thin, through all kinds of difficulties in battle. But of course, near the end of Jesus' life, Jesus goes to Satan, uh, Jesus goes to Peter and says, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. We all know the story. Peter falls, falls very, very tragically there. I, I think he actually probably thought that it was going to be something like some Roman soldier going up to him with a sword and, and saying, like, deny Jesus now. You know, no, I'm not going to do it. And, you know, yeah, you're going to do it. Deny him now. You know, this kind of like big kind of buff contest, right? He probably had something like that in mind. But instead, it was a slow seduction. His overconfidence in himself was exposed when he denied Jesus, not to some Roman soldier, but to fairly insignificant people. Peter had to learn some crucial lessons through that experience, and we're going to read now what his reflections were on that experience. So turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to read verses 5 to 11, and I want you to read this from the perspective of Peter, who has gone through this experience of falling to Satan's traps, and now here he is, a much older man, writing counsel to us about this topic of spiritual warfare. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 to 11. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray here. Father in heaven, open our eyes to the words that Peter has written here. Open our eyes to see the counsel, to hear and receive the counsel of this man who had been humbled because of his failure, because of his his falling into the temptation of selfishness. Help us to learn from him about spiritual war, that we may not be those whom Satan devours. I pray, Father, for the grace to to be alert and vigilant, even for our own own hearts here as we study this very important passage of Scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so what, what did Peter learn from his failure, from his denials? Well, it's pretty obvious here. Uh, One of the things that he learned is that he wasn't such a tough guy. He was a lot more vulnerable than he thought he was. He learned that the devil was more powerful than he thought he was. But I think more than anything, he probably gained this sense of warfare. 
It's very interesting that, that Paul closes Ephesians with a section on warfare. And then here, Peter closes his letter, this is basically the end of the letter, also with thoughts on warfare. I try to think a lot about words and language, and I try to pay attention as much as I can to that. And a lot of you know that one of the themes of my, my, my writing and my speaking is that words get overused and they get confused and shrouded in confusion over the years. So one of the, the, the strategies of the devil is to, to make words lose their force. And in, in the book that I wrote, King Jesus Claims His Church, I said that even the word kingdom has kind of gotten diluted and we've, we can use that word a lot, oh, kingdom this, kingdom that. And I said, well, why not use the word nation to try to get a little bit more punch back to the word, to consider the church as a nation. It's of course a kingdom, but because that word has been overused, I propose using the word kingdom. And I cited a book in my book that points out that of all of the terms that are used to describe the church, bride, uh, building, uh, branches on a vine, those are all metaphors. Those are all like not actually valid descriptions of what the church is. They're, they contain value and there's, there's a descriptive value there, but they're not actually direct uh, correspondences of what the church is. But the church is literally a nation. It is literally a kingdom. In the same way, when we think about spiritual war, it's not a metaphor. It's not a metaphor at all. And I, I, I've heard people use this language of warfare being a metaphor. And you want to like scream and shout. It would be like saying, oh yeah, I'm going let, to, let's talk about the, the metaphor of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the significance of that metaphor. And all of you would say, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not a metaphor. A metaphor of Russia invading Ukraine. That is happening as we speak. And to use that description of that being a metaphor would almost be insulting to all the people who have died in that invasion. It's very similar with this concept of warfare. This is a very real concept. This is something that we need to, to hammer home in our minds that this is not a, a metaphor. This is the real deal here. Of course, it's not a warfare in the sense of flesh and blood. It is more real in that it is in the spiritual realm. I am utterly convinced, I am 100% convinced that one of the major problems that the church faces, including us, is a lack of that deep sense of warfare, a lack of that getting up in the morning and feeling it throughout your day that I have an enemy, that enemy is after me, after my family, after my friends, after the lost, after it, this enemy is, is on the loose. He is, Satan is this, this powerful angel who's gone rogue with his powers and he is destroying people in his rampage and with his intelligence. The other day I was, I was spending some time in prayer and I had this acute sense when I was praying that Satan wanted one of our children in particular. And I was very gripped in the moment at this thought that, that I, I had in prayer and wow, I began to just pray fervently for that child and interact with this child differently because of that. I have no doubt that the people who are the most driven and determined in the church today are the most consumed by this concept of warfare. It's in their minds, it's, it's churning, they're, they're thinking about this warfare. But people who are apathetic or struggling or sinning or flailing, they don't have it. They don't have this sense of warfare. What I wanna do is highlight a few points from this passage that we just read in 1 Peter chapter five. My first point is that a warfare mindset makes us submissive to one another. A warfare mindset makes us submissive to one another. Okay, so I hope you all saw this in the passage that we just read, but he basically opens with it. He says in verse five, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. Okay, so he opens up with this language of submission. Now, again, it's fascinating to watch this right now in Ukraine. Some of you, I'm sure most of you are watching uh, the, all the news and reading the articles there. There have been all these people that are civilians that never thought they would be engaged in a military conflict that all of a sudden were 
were now being either conscripted or voluntarily joining in this fight. And just as people do when the stakes are high and warfare is there, they, they sort of self-assemble this leadership structure. And there's all these people that are like now captains and, and generals and, all, you know, I don't know all the names of the, of the offices there, but they have self-assembled because you don't go out to warfare solo. You don't go out to warfare in some kind of, can you imagine how nuts that would be to go out uh, against Russia with some sort of like, yeah, I'm just going to go out there and with my pistol and hope for the best? Nobody's going to ever do that, right? You self-assemble, you submit to one another, you create all of the, the structures that the military is so good at. And it's just the natural outgrowth, right, of being in war is this, this, this desire to, to submit to one another in some sort of structured way. Paul, Peter opens up here with an admonition for young people to be in submission to older people. I think we know why, those of us who are especially greater than 40 years old, um, that when you are young, you are overconfident. You just are. I was totally overconfident. For most, I'm probably still too overconfident. Um, um, but I was even more overconfident when I was under 40. I was just like, oh yeah, you think you can do so much, and you think you know so much, and you have all the answers. And there's just a feature of youth which is overconfidence. And not just overconfidence, but almost a, like I know better than other people. I remember growing up in Southern California, that's where I'm from, especially when I was in my 20s and before my 20s in high school and college, the, I remember often thinking my parents were born and raised in India. They don't really understand what it's like to be here in America. They don't really get my situation. And I didn't go to them with a lot of things that I knew in my mind I should have. And now I look back and I talk to them, I'm like, wow, you have a lot more wisdom than I thought you had. And I wish I had like, gone to you then because it would have saved me a lot of heartache. It is, it is something that I would urge all of you to make a dominant aspect of your life is to be in submission to older people in this sense of being effective in the fight. You may want to be the solo person who goes out with your pistol and tries to take on the Russian army. It's not going to work. It's never going to work. It's never worked in the history of the world. It's not going to work with you. Peter, of course, goes on further and he says, everybody submit. Hey, hey, and I think he realizes that adults are overconfident. Like I said, I'm, I'm sure I'm overconfident. There's that joke that, that you, you see, and I, I saw this just last week. I was driving in um, just locally here, and somebody had a mattress tied to their, the roof of their car, and going at high speeds, and with one hand, they've got one hand on the mattress, the other hand on the wheel, and you're thinking, yeah, right, this thing catches, catches wind at 40 miles an hour. With one hand, you're really going to stop this mattress, right? Total overconfidence, total ridiculous hubris. We are overconfident by nature. We, and, and not only are we overconfident by nature, we don't learn effectively that we are overconfident. How many times have we said, oh yeah, I'm going to wake up in the morning from 9 to 9.30, I'm going to do this thing. From 10 to 10.30, I'm going to do this. From 10.30 to 11, I'm going to get this thing done. From noon to 1, it's going to be great, right? You have this... At two, you're like, oh, I'm still on my 10 o'clock task here. Something, something has gone wrong. And then what do you do the next day? You do the very same thing, right? You've done it. I know you've done it. Uh, total overconfidence here. What, what Peter is, is urging us is there's something about other people. Other people see your flaws. Other people see your problems. Other people see you better than you see you. And he's saying, in order to be effective as Christians, you have to be in submission to one another. It's a mark of maturity. Could you honestly say in your deep heart of hearts that you're in submission? I was, in our agape, I've been, I've been doing this little private counting experiment, and I've been, I've been paying attention to the verbs that we used. Interesting to compare across agapes. The number one verb that is used in our agape is the word sharing. Sharing. 
Can I share next? Or when you shared last, uh, I've noticed that. Like, dominant verb is sharing that's used. Now, that's a fine verb. It's a, non, it's a non-threatening verb. It's nice. It's not a bad word at all. I'm not at all discounting it. But you don't ever hear, even in our agape, submission, some of those stronger words that are much more forceful. When you read Ignatius's letter as he's going away to death, there, amazing set of letters that he writes. He's acutely aware of the enemy. What you get when you read his letters is this sense of military-like submission. He's aware of the threats facing the church. I don't think he uses the word, I haven't checked, but I don't think he uses the word sharing. I think he uses, I know he uses much stronger verbs. I have been doing men's accountability groups now for a little more than 25 years. And, almost 27 actually, and the, the accountability groups, I'm convinced that there's a huge value in them, but one of the main pitfalls of accountability groups is to say something like this. You hear somebody say like, I messed up this week, I looked at pornography, or I did something like that. And the other person sitting around will say, oh, that's too bad, we're gonna pray for you. And uh, just, yeah, keep, keep going here. And the next week, yeah, hey, God has grace for you, and, and we're, gonna, we're gonna pray for you some more, and all that. It's a lot of sharing. Tons of sharing. And again, I'm not discounting sharing. Those are great things. But rarely do you have someone who says, all right, bring your laptop next week. We're going to install this piece of software in the meeting. You're going to report to me this, this, and this. You're going to do this, this, and this. Like, you hardly see that. You hardly see that military-like submission where one person says, no, we're not going to just going to sit around and commiserate. We're actually going to, going to step it up and have real submission here. I'm convinced that one of the main reasons why there's ongoing failure, even with structures like this, is a lack of submission, a lack of imperium. Okay. The next point here that Peter gives us, right after the submission point, is he says, Be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Okay, so my my second point is, knowing the strength of our enemy should make us humble. Knowing the strength of our enemy should make us humble. Okay, so right now in Ukraine, people are very, very afraid, for good reason, to provoke Russia because they know that Russia has nuclear weapons. And Putin has made noises that he might use these nuclear weapons. And so... There's always the sense when you read the news that they're, they're sort of limited on what they can do. They're not going to go in and counterattack Russia. They're not going to do anything like that because they know this would be World War III. The strength of the enemy, in this case Russia, has made the Ukrainians and most of the world very cautious, very humble. Of course, Peter learned his humility through failure. He learned it because he denied Jesus three times, and here he is. I, th- I think when he's writing this out for us, he's, he's thinking of that, wow, I was a proud man. I was a very proud person in this. But he, he throws in a key insight here, which is that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And I find it very interesting that the major authors of the New Testament, many of the major authors, have very similar sentiments where in this case he's saying God resists, some translations, God opposes the proud. John says, if you, uh, John gives a similar example of where God can be your enemy or you can be on the wrong side of God where he says, sorry, James says, friendship with the world is enmity with God. Enmity means what? Yeah, like hatred, being hostile there. If you love the world, John says, the love of the Father is not in you. So there are ways in which you can actually have God become your enemy, according to Peter, J- James, and John. Why is this? Well, let's go back to our analogy here about nations and warfare and all that. One of the things that will flip very quickly the United States relationship to you is if you commit treason. If you somehow support and collaborate with the enemy, with some other nation, to undermine the United States, all 
all bets are off about your fate here. You will be in a completely different zone. Every country knows that if you commit treason, this is very serious business. It's often been the death penalty. I will say here to everybody in this room, very, very clearly and strongly, you will not experience God's blessing or God's power if you are holding on to the world, if you are a proud person in any way. Again, think about these verses. God resists the proud. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you, and friendship with the world is enmity or hatred towards God. Strong language there. Are we supporting the enemy with entertainment choices, fashion choices, dating choices, social choices, whatever the choice might be, how are we doing that? My third point is that understanding the strength of the enemy makes us sound the alarm. Again, it's been very interesting to watch this in Ukraine. There's different cities that have been attacked, and when there's reason to believe that a city will be attacked, they will send flyers in, they will use social media, they will use speakers, they'll have people drive through. I mean, they'll do all kinds of tactics to get people to say, get out of there. Get out of there now, the city is going to be attacked. Most people have been going to Poland, they've been going to Romania, they've been going to different places to gain safety. But it is the life or death nature of the Ukraine situation that motivates people, of course. So here, I will say that it is the life or death nature of spiritual war that motivates evangelism, right? Again, it is the consciousness of this war that is a powerful indicator of your, your drive your, that will determine your evangelism. Paul, it's very interesting the way that he describes it in his section on spiritual warfare. He says that your shoes are supposed to be the gospel of peace. Like, the gospel is what keeps you moving. It's what, it's what, it's what animates you. It's what, it's what keeps you from being stationary. I wonder how many of us, again, as we wake up in the morning and we see all of the chaos in the world and we see all the crazy things that are happening right now, how do we want to sound the alarm? My wife and I were just in Cambridge. We just got back from Cambridge uh, a few minutes ago before the meeting started. Uh, we were actually able to go out on a little date. That was nice. And we were, we were walking along the sidewalk, and my wife said something to the effect of, and we lived in Cambridge for many years, she said, Cambridge is a crazy place because of all the sin, and she pointed out all the different things that we were seeing. And um, it's true. It is. It was, uh, I think it was Dostoevsky who said, when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing, they believe in everything. And it's true. I mean, you see every crazy thing out there that is openly embraced and indulged in places like that. When you see that, what does it inspire you to? Does it make you sound the alarm? Or does it leave you complacent? Okay, my fourth point is that Understanding the strength of God drives us to safety. Understanding the strength of God drives us to safety. Okay, so again, I'm using this Ukraine analogy here. I, I watched a video recently of people boarding trains. There's a very extensive train network in Ukraine and they've been using the trains to get out and to go to places like Poland and Romania. And it's been fascinating to watch people get out of Ukraine, get to safe territory, to walk out of the trains and be re reunited with family, to be safe, and oh, you can imagine how joyful people are in these moments. The relief and the joy they have of, wow, I'm in a safe kingdom, I'm in a safe nation now. When we think about this, this concept of understanding the strength of God, uh, again, let's think about how Paul opens up his discussion on spiritual warfare. Remember what he says? He says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. What does that imply? That implies that if you are in the Lord, you're going to be strong. And if you're far from the Lord, you're not going to be strong. This is precisely the role of the spiritual disciplines. The, the role of the spiritual disciplines is to keep us in the Lord, to keep us strong in the Lord so that we're not drifting away. Because guess what? If you're not there, the predator is coming after you. The serpent is coming after you. That, that roaring lion is coming after you. 
And here's the basic principle. I, I mentioned this before, that if you have been in the bondage of sin, whether it's lying, pornography, anger, materialism, laziness, fashion, time wasting, whatever it is, you know how powerful it is and you know how, how gripping it can be. And you know the feeling of so often people will say, like, I'm just, I'm, I'm on YouTube and I'm just wasting time and I know I don't want to do it, but I just keep doing it. And you kind of feel this, like, kind of like you're being carried along, almost like beyond your ability to, to say no. You, you feel the power, it's hard to describe, but you feel the power of being in the grip of something demonic, something stronger than you. And I can tell you right now, you cannot break out of it on your own. You can't. You don't have the power to do that. You can only get out of that by getting to the person who is stronger than the person who is stronger than you. Okay, I'll say it again. You've had this sensation, right, where you're in the grip of something. And again, there's a lot of different sins. There's a lot of different issues. It can be apathy, laziness, lying, gossip, pornography, materialism, anger, fashion, time wasting, whatever it is. And there's something about that, that realm where we just, we just do it and we kind of don't love it, but we're carried along by it. And we're, by the time we're done, we feel gross and, oh, why did I do that? Why did I waste all that time on YouTube? Why did I do this? Why did I spend all that? I should have, I should have been reading the Bible. I should, ah, oh, man, it's, it, you, but you feel this. You can only break out of it by getting to the person who is stronger than the person who is stronger than you. The devil is stronger than you. You have no hope. You have zero hope. I'm telling you, you have zero hope to break out of that. The only way you can get out of that is by getting into the person who is stronger than the person who is stronger than you. This is why we see in these passages concepts like be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. His might. If you are not in the Lord, you have no hope. When I see people drifting from the Lord and, and prayer and the word and worship, I just, oh, it tears me up. I think uh, you are, you're, you're like that, that, that antelope that's the slow antelope. It's going to be, it may not be tomorrow, but man, that lion's going to come after you and you're going to get devoured. My next point is that warfare calls forth service and sacrifice. Warfare calls forth service and sacrifice. I was recently talking to someone uh, about how during World War II, it was this really, really interesting time because people were planting gardens in their homes and around their homes because they wanted to save all of the canned vegetables and canned, canned fruits for the troops abroad. So that was regarded, of course, you know, you, the store very well. And so people are like, yeah, yeah, we're going to plant as much. And this whole movement was all over the country of like planting as much. And people sacrificed a lot. They ate simply for the sake of the troops. I watched an interview recently of a championship tennis player, and the, apparently the world's number one boxer, I didn't realize this, but the world's number one boxer is Ukrainian. And he moved back to the Ukraine so that he could fight for his country there. And these are people who are, I'm sure, are very wealthy, successful people. It's very inspiring. It's very inspiring to see that. But people give their all, don't they, in warfare? Isn't that like one of the things about warfare that is even though we can disagree with, with all of the, the malice, but we can admire the sacrifice that people are making. In verse 10, Peter uses a fascinating word. He says, may God perfect you. Some translations say, may God restore you. Katartizo is the Greek word there. It's the same word that's used when, when the fishermen are mending their nets. So it's like, picture something that's a net, but it's got holes in it, and you're patching those up to make it a complete net. What holes do you have? What holes do you have in your spiritual life? Um, a lot of you in the room have taken my fundamental text class at Sattler. And, you know, I like to give these quizzes early on that are, are designed to be wake-up calls. You know, I'll, I'll ask questions about um, who is Zephaniah and how does he connect to Jeremiah. Tell me about Give me a little bit about uh, Philippi. Tell me about Antioch. Tell me about these things that are a little more deep than just what's the story of Daniel and the lion's den. And I've done, this, done these, these tests all over the world in many different countries now. And more often than not, people bomb these. People born and raised in the church do terribly on these. 
And I do it as a wake-up call because I want people to realize you don't even know the Word of God yet. You don't even really know the Scriptures yet in any, in any solid way. And, and uh, I'm very passionate about this because in spiritual warfare, of course, the main instrument that we have that is offensive as well as defensive is the sword, which is described as, yeah, the Word of God. And if you don't even have like an understanding of the scriptures, you're not going to be able to yield to use the word, the sword there. It is tragic the way we are there. And not just with understanding, but with using. You can hold a sword here, right? I can hold a sword and I can walk up into battle. But if I'm not wielding the sword, I might as well not even carry it, right? It's a dead weight to me. And there's a lot of people out there who have somewhat of a, of a grasp on the sword, maybe a loose kind of feeble grasp, but they're not even using it. It's like, what's the point? And of course, using the sword is doing the word. There's a lot of people as well that want to dabble in the battle. They want to try it for a little bit, then they get tired, and they want to go home. Very few are willing to endure to the end. My final point is that awareness of the enemy makes us sober and vigilant. Awareness of the enemy makes us sober and vigilant. All right, I hope you saw that here, but look back at Peter with me, and you can see where he says this. In verse 8, he says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Sobriety and vigilance. These are the attributes that are, are used here. Now, as I, it's very interesting. When you, when you think about what does is, what is a casualty look like in spiritual warfare? You know, it's, we know what a casualty looks like in physical war, right? Someone gets shot or they lose a limb or some injury happens to them. What does casualty look like in spiritual war? What it looks like is someone who their, their wits their, their senses are, are somehow blocked or they, they can't see things correctly. And like you're talking to them and you're just like, what? Like, you don't get this? Like, what happened? Uh, I've, I've, had, I've had tragic stories. I had uh, one, one story that still breaks my heart of someone that I've known since college, uh, very close friend. Uh, he worked with me for, for many years at, at the company that I work at now. And he was a leader in the Christian fellowship, very, very strong there. And there was, it, he married, he's got uh, several children, uh, seven children actually, and uh, married for many, many years. And I saw him, several of us saw him in the company, and he was just really, really close with another person, another woman, and, which is not his wife. And we were like, hey, what are you doing here? Like, this is not good. You shouldn't be, it would kind of be physically inappropriate and just socially inappropriate. And... And I talked to him, several people talked to him, and the same person who I knew in college, who was the strong person in the fellowship, started rationalizing or brushing it off or let's just not talk about that. And I was just, what, what? Like, you're married, you got seven children at home. Like, you don't see this? Like, you don't, you're not bothered by being inappropriate with this woman who also was married to somebody else? And um, it went on and on for a couple of years. Eventually, he left the company, left his wife uh, completely, and is now uh, not at home anymore. Really, really sad story there. Casualties look like dysfunctional reasoning. There's a, there's a passage that I, I think about often. This is a passage that, for me, is, is one that I think is especially precious to me because of how I've, 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 I've seen it and felt it over the years. It's... It's this passage where, where Paul speaks about basically people being taken captive by the devil who are caught in a snare, and he says that we're supposed to reprove them, be gentle to them, and he uses this phrase, that they may come to their senses. Do you remember that? He says that they may come to their senses, and I'm like, yes, that's it. That's the word I was looking for. That's the phrase. I've seen so many people. My friend is not in his senses. He's lost his mind, and he progressively with a sin more and more just didn't listen to people, got just increasingly dismissive to the point where he left his wife and children. That is what spiritual warfare looks like. Peter temporarily lost his senses when he was there 
talking to those people about Jesus, didn't keep his wits about him. He lost it in that. He lost his vigilance, his, his ability to, to, to be aware and to fight as he should have fought. I'm going to close here by reading a story that I've, I've read this many times at my workplace. Uh, I have a fascination with the realm of addiction. People in our world are increasingly addicted. Addiction is more and more a component of our society. And uh, people are addicted to their phones, they're addicted to pornography, they're addicted to alcohol and tobacco and caffeine and marijuana and just substances all over that people are addicted to. And I hate addiction. And so in, in my company, we have been funding for many years a company that is involved in fighting addiction. And I'm gonna read you the story here just to give you a sense of what somebody now after an event would exhort us all with respect to sobriety and vigilance in the natural realm. And then we'll tie it back and then I'll close. It's written by a, a mother. Listen to this account. I would, ra I would much rather be talking to my son, Kent, than talking about Kent. Kent was my second child. He was a sweet, gentle, very normal child. He liked dinosaurs when he was little. He liked to play outside. He liked to play Super Mario Brothers and Legos. He performed self-taught magic and card tricks at his younger cousin's birthday party. Kent had a fantastic sense of humor and would make everyone laugh. Kent could master the most complex puzzles and mazes. He had a keen sense for how things worked. Toss him a Rubik's Cube and he could solve it in minutes. He loved to read. He was a good student and a good friend. He was a Boy Scout, sang in a school choir, went to church camp, went on missions trips, and volunteered in the tech booth at church. We went to church as a family. Kent loved his family and enjoyed spending time with his aunt and uncle, grandparents, sister, and me, his mom. He began to change when he was a sophomore in high school, and I noticed that he became restless and spent more time in his room with the door closed. When he was 15, he called me the night before Thanksgiving and told me that he was out with some friends and wasn't coming home that night. He said he was fine and was calling because he didn't want me to worry. He hung up. I was frantic and spent part of the evening driving around and the other part calling every one of his friends to find him. I knew something was very, very wrong. Kent had always obeyed the rules. He came home about 6 a.m. and I was waiting for him. Life changed that day for us. He went to the doctor and was drug tested. After I learned the results, his computer time was restricted. He was not allowed to close his bedroom door and his comings and goings were strictly monitored. He did not want to become a drug addict and after some time, it seemed like he made it out. It se he seemed to get his dreams and goals back. He asked if he could go to a different high school in the fall because he wanted a clean start and we found a charter school that suited him to a T. In fact, he completed his junior and senior years in less than one year. He loved going to school and work. He was happy and enjoyed spending time with his family. I thought we were in the clear. It was the Christmas before Kent would turn 18. His dentist recommended that he have his wisdom teeth extracted. And as a normal routine gave him a prescription for a painkiller to be used after his oral surgery. I had it filled and put it in the kitchen cabinet, but I noticed the bottle looked different a couple days later. With a pounding heart and a feeling of dread, I counted the pills and then confronted my son. After a while, he admitted to taking some. I was heartsick. I thought we had made it, and I felt so bad for unknowingly putting the drug right in front of him. I asked Kent why he wanted to take drugs, and the answer he gave was bone chilling. He asked me to remember a time that I felt great, the best. When I had the memory, he said, the first time you get high, it's better than that. All you can think about is feeling that way again, only it's physically, chemically impossible. He explained how brain chemicals are altered and why people take more stronger drugs and increase the frequency trying to get back to the feeling of that first high. But Ken didn't want to take drugs. He worked very hard to live his life without them. At 18, he moved into a house with a couple of other young adults. He was finishing his first year of college, had a great job, and was able to support himself. For the next six months, Kent enjoyed the freedom of being on his own. 
He would call often and have us pick him up on Sunday mornings to go to church and have lunch afterward. Then on a Monday of September 2003, I had a life-changing knock on my door. <clears throat> my heart dropped as I heard the words that my son, my handsome, sensitive, funny, talented, smart son, died from an accidental prescription drug overdose. Kent and two other kids crushed up Oxycontin and washed them down with beer. Kent got sleepy and told the other two kids he wanted to go to sleep, so they left. Kent went to sleep, and as he slept, the drug slowed his respiratory system down until it stopped completely. His roommate found him the next day, already gone. <clears throat> I wish I had been better educated about drugs. I also wish his friends had been better educated and more aware of what was happening to Kent. Maybe Kent would be alive today. But he isn't. And I have to live with the pain every day. I'll never see him grow up, get married, or have children. I'll never see him live his life and realize his dreams. I could spend the rest of my life being angry, but I'm not sure who I should be angry with. I was a good mom. I put a lot of time into my children. And I forgive my son. I'm trying to honor his memory by helping other parents and kids understand the dangers of using drugs, especially prescription drugs. I'm hoping that by telling Kent's story, perhaps just one person will make a different choice. Maybe a parent will follow that gut feeling or maybe find out what is still hanging out in their medicine cabinet and dispose of or safeguard their prescription drugs. Maybe just one person. True story here that I just read to you. Heartbreaking story. I read it at the company I'm in because we've been funding for several years uh, uh, the best company that's trying to fight against this and come up with different medications that won't have these, these properties. It's a, it, that's beside the point. I say this and I read this story because this woman loved her son, no doubt, but she lacked this combination of insight and vigilance into the area that ultimately took Kent's life. She had a hole in her net. She didn't know she had this hole, but she had a hole in her net. But that hole proved to be the demise, the death of her son. I guarantee you that everybody in this room has holes. Everybody in this room has holes. We do. I have tried to convince you this evening that our awareness of warfare, our awareness of the enemy and his strength are an essential component, not an optional component, but an essential component for the successful Christian life. I've talked about the warfare mindset and how it ought to drive us to submission, how knowledge of the enemy and his tactics should make us humble. It should make us sound the alarm through evangelism. It should, uh, understanding the strength of God should drive us to safety, should drive us to the strength of the Lord, should draw us into service and sacrifice and make us sober and vigilant. I say all these things because I was, I was praying a lot about what to share tonight. I was, I was really searching and, and, and seeking God about this, but I, I really believe that this is what the Lord has for us uh, this evening here. And so I want us to, to consider well, where are our holes? Where are we lacking in this? What component of, of what I've spoken today is, is an area that you need to address? Are you really in meaningful submission? Or are you just sharing? Again, sharing's not wrong. But are you in meaningful submission? Are you truly humble? Are you truly repairing the holes? Are you truly finding strength in the, in the Lord and the power of his might? This is essential for you, for your family, and for the body as a whole. May we not fall victim as the devil would love us to do again and again and again and again to these weaknesses that may prove to be our demise. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, Forgive us for, for being slothful and not paying attention. Forgive us for neglecting the, 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 the disciplines, the discipleship that keeps us in your strength and in the power of your might. Father, this is a very, very sober topic that can, uh, can be something that either saves us or destroys us. I pray with all of my heart that you would help us to be truly vigilant, truly submissive, as, as people who are badly needing your grace. I pray, Father, that we would find our strength in you individually and corporately, that we would learn what it is to engage in military-like submission, to, 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 to truly experience this, uh, not in, in, a, in a sense of fear, but in a sense of, of gladness. 
work, Father, this, this evening through my words, through our conversations. May these words be sealed into our hearts by the power of Jesus' name and the action of the Holy Spirit. We say all these things in the name and the power of our Lord Jesus. Amen.